This story is brought to your ears by all our fantastic supporters on Patreon. To get in on the action yourself with bloopers, extras, and the occasional early story, join us at patreon.com slash voiceofallmtg. We'd like to thank our newest patron, Phoenix Madrone, for already donating. For more stories, or just to chat, visit voiceofallmtg.com. And now, Voice of All presents... The Great Concourse A Story of Ravnica by Adam Lee Are you there, sister? I don't know. I can feel a vibration. It has to be her. Follow it. You're further than last time. It's like she's everywhere, but I can't find her. I know she's there, but... It's too much. Sister... Focus. It's too much. The three dryads sat in a circle, as they had done for the past three months, hoping they could make contact. They did it alone, in a small grove where the branches of the trees curved about them to create a quiet, interior space apart from the massive granite and brick buildings that sprawled about them like an ancient, fallen golem. They awoke from their trance and allowed the world to come back into focus. The wind rustling through the leaves, the short song of a bird, and the constant, faraway drone of Ravnica and its inhabitants moving like some endless ocean. They were an inseparable trio, but far from identical. Oba was wild and full of life, her hair tangled with leaves and vines, her eyes shifting with her moods from green, like flecks of emerald and jade, to smoky brown. Cess, unlike her sister, was ordered in manner and speech. Her hair was held in place by a headpiece made of goldenwood, and fell to her shoulders in a cascade of auburn. Sim was both the eldest and the bridge between the other two sisters. Even though she was a small, slight dryad, a power existed within her that everyone in the conclave could feel. Sim could find paths where none could be seen, and always found a way to balance the needs of one with the other. Sim was the first to speak. I was close. Really close this time. But it's so confusing. She's there in that giant web, I know it. It's just like she can't focus. Or I can't focus. Sim ran her slender fingers through close-cropped hair, and then pulled a green hood over her head to close off the outside world. We saw it too. Oba looked at her other sister, Cess, who finished her sentence. But it's too big. They fell back into the grass, letting the coolness of it bring them further out of trance. Sim stared at the skyline, her chin resting on her knees. We've got to reach her, or she'll leave us all. It's getting dangerous. It was harder to get you back this time. All of Celestia are counting on us and we can't fail them. We can't let the guilt dissolve. We can't give up on her. What if she doesn't want to be brought back, Sim? Are any of us strong enough to go against her will? What if it's a test? Maybe she wants something from us. After a moment of silence, an invisible understanding passed between the sisters. Sim got up. Suniel will want to know what we saw. Suniel sat among the high priests of Selesnia and could see it written on their faces. The empathic link of the world soul exposed in its subtle, nonverbal way a truth they could not turn away from. Mat Selesnia was inexorably fading like the light of a dying candle. After the initial grim reports of more lost members, withering belief and factional rumblings were listened to by the members, the elf priest Molander slowly stood up and addressed the assembly. He looked haggard for an elf, Sunio thought, but then again, Molander had always looked haggard. We have to think the unthinkable. As much as we would like to continue wishing for some random miracle to fall from the skies, we have to prepare. Selesnia must go on with or without a Perrin, Mart Selesnia. 
Molander waited for a moment for his words to sink in, while an assistant brought an ornate scroll to the table. Since the attack on V2 Gazi, I have begun working on a way to keep the guild alive by teaching our precepts at an academy. A place where the structure and ethos of our guild can be taught, refined, and carried out by future members of our- And now it comes out. Troslin rose and planted his boulder-like fists on the table. You can't wait to impose your little grid of rules over us all. He turned to address the others. Where there is life, there is Celestnia. And that is all anyone in this guild needs to know. You want rules and academies. Go to the Azorius. Not rules, Troslin. Order. Our guild is breaking apart. Members are leaving. Even our most devoted are losing their connection to the world soul. We need something to build around. Something tangible. I'll show you tangible. Spoken like a gruel. You'd have us all living in rubble within a year. Alcaris spoke just loud enough to pull their attention from each other. Gentlemen, if you have forgotten, not long ago they dragged Rakdos through the streets like a butchered Indrik and threw him into a bloody hell pit. No one knows if he's dead or alive. Why is it those maniacs can figure it out and we sit here shooting slurs at each other? If you think that running about like a pack of wild dogs while cannibalizing one another is figuring it out, then by all means, use them as a model of success. Sadruna's face held a look that emphasized her point. We are nothing like those murderers. Sunil watched as the old arguments inevitably began to arise. The High Council began to break down into quarreling factions along well-worn lines of dissent. Those who were for returning to nature, allowing the trees to grow wild and worshipping the ancient rites of life and those who were for order, making sure that upholding the structure of the guild was made paramount. As the discussion devolved into the emotionally charged noise of confusion and righteousness, Sunil sighed and looked out the window at a wooded hill in the distance, surrounded by peaks and spires. A small, insignificant place where three young dryads sought to make contact with one of the most ancient beings on Ravnica. Sunil's house was a sculptural masterpiece. Amid the angular bricks and hard edges of Ravnican architecture, the sensuous curves and organic flow of Sunil's home made it seem like something from another world. Sunil had formed his house out of several nearby cedars, bending and calling their material to grow in particular ways pleasing to the eye and to the hand. It was said that Sunil's home was a visual representation of the lattice of the world soul, the empathic energy that connected all of Selesnia. But the woodshaper humbly maintained that he only followed the silent guidance of Mat Selesnia when creating his works. Sim sat on a comfortable chair big enough to hold her, Oba, and Sess. The three dryads looked pale, but resolute as they sipped tea made from wild wire and palace root. I was close to her, Sunil. I could feel her in there, like she's trapped within web, but I can't seem to get close enough to touch it. I feel like I'm diving for shells and I run out of air. We can't hold her in there long enough. The lattice is too far away, and we don't have the energy to get her there. You need more mana. Sunil pensively pulled on his beard and looked out at the carefully sculpted gardens that surrounded his home. That's all there is to it. Mm. No, there has to be a way. Why won't she come back? Sunil turned and sat down. Could be many things, Sess. She could be lost. She could be dying, although I highly doubt that. Perhaps... Perhaps it is an ebb and flow cycle that we are too short-lived to understand. My own feeling is that she wants to be there, and she's waiting for us. A test. That's what I thought. Oba sat back in the chair. Waiting? Waiting for what? I don't know, but I too feel it is a test for our guild. 
Oba smiled and elbowed her sister while Sunil continued. Chaos is reigning on Ravnica. The guilds are in disarray. Some have collapsed and and our own guild is fracturing over stupidity. If only we could truly come together like our Perun has instructed us. If only we could harness the power that is all around us. But without her leadership, we are breaking apart into separate visions of what Selesnya is. Sunil went deep into thought, and Sim watched him as her sisters nodded off. She saw him pick up a piece of wood and begin to imbue it with mana, molding it as a potter would a piece of clay. After an hour of this, and with even Sim's eyes drifting shut, Sunil finally looked up. I have an idea. The key to being a wood shaper is allowing the lines to blur between you and what you are creating. As I am sculpting, the wood and my hands become blended together, so there is no point where the wood ends and where my hands begin. When that happens, I am actually drawing power from the life force of the wood, and using that to help me shape it. If I connected you to a tree in this way, you could draw power from it, and use that power to help you move deeper and touch the lattice. There would be no risk. Flesh and wood are not that dissimilar. Sounds like fun. Early in the morning, before the sun could even be seen above the towering buildings, Sunil led the sisters through a series of winding streets and alleys that finally led to a cobblestone path before a wood of oaks. They walked into the woods, and after a while felt as if there were no buildings around them. Sim imagined they were surrounded by miles upon miles of forests. Soon, they arrived at a circle of particularly old and gnarled oak trees. They stopped and sat beneath the canopy as Sunil prepared himself. After a moment, he nodded at Sim. Are you ready? We will do our best. After encanting an ancient spell known only to the dryads of the Conclave, Sim, Sess, and Oba entered the trance. Once they became grounded in it, they went deeper and saw the lattice spread before them. We're ready. ready. Bind, Bind us, us to it. it. Sim hoped Sunil could sense them empathically through the world soul. Sim could feel Oba and Sess around her like ripples in water. She could feel their excitement, apprehension, and above all, hope. Whatever happened, they were together. It was all that mattered. And then Sunil's magic flowed into them. As he bound the roots of the trees to them, Sim could feel the life pour into her being. As if in response, strands of the lattice reached out and began to weave through them like glowing thread. At first, there was a pleasant tingle as the root-like strands melded into their skin, but Sim began to feel a small seed of panic as more threads interwove and began pulling them closer to the lattice. She could feel its power, and a sudden sense of suffocation rushed up within her. A primal part of her brain struggled blindly to break free of its web. I can't breathe. And then, in a wave, millions of tendrils streamed into Sim and flooded her consciousness with an ocean of energy. In an act of desperation, she reached out for her sisters, hoping to grab on to something solid in the roaring torrent. Somehow, she found them. Their presences vague and blurred within the myriad network of fibers and light. She could feel them, their memories, thoughts, and emotions. They clung to each other as the storm of energy blew through them. After a timeless moment, the vibration slowed and harmonized. She looked around from within the web of the lattice, feeling its pulsating thrum. Their connection was complete. And then, in a voice as clear as a crystal bell, Mat Selesnya spoke. You have delved deep, little seed. I wonder if you have the strength to bear the fruit of the message I have to give you? The voice was like a great bell, but only a web of light pulsed before them. Yes, great mother. I will bear any burden for you. For too long I slept within the great tree. Speaking without words to faraway ears. Ambition of the rootless ones proved too powerful. For my seedlings to survive, 
we must grow an army capable of stopping such ambitions. Even those of the scheming dragon. I will root you to the lattice. As a tree grows from a seed, so will you pull armies from the source of all life. You will populate Selesnia with a sacred host willing to perish so that the greater good may thrive. All life returns to the lattice. Do not covet your own particular life as the ghost dealers would covet a purse of coins. Do not hold back in your sacrifice. Give freely to the whole and spread this message far and wide. I will now complete the woodshaper's work and bond you with all the trees of Ravnica. Their roots will be the new power of Selesnia. But be warned, this is a door through which the three of you can never return. Do you understand? Sim looked at her sisters. We understand, Great Mother. Under the oaks, Suniel sat with the three sisters. They were cradled in the base of the great tree, its roots bound to their flesh. He could feel the distant pulse of the world soul, some feeling he couldn't quite put his finger on. But he knew, somehow, that the Dryads had made contact with Mott Selesnia. A great excitement washed over him, and he scanned the faces of the sisters for any sign of them returning from their trance. The instant they awoke, he would separate them from the roots of the ancient oak, go straight to the conclave for an emergency session, and hopefully tell the assembly the good news of the Parin's return. As Suniel imagined the restoration of Selesnia, Sim gasped and her eyes snapped open. As he began to summon the mana in order to release them, Sim grasped his arm. No need, Woodshaper. It is done. We are one. Like a ball of writhing snakes, the roots began to cocoon and absorb the dryads. Their small forms quickly pulled toward the trunks. Suniel struggled to pull them free, but in spite of his magic, his attempts were futile. He could only claw at the glowing snarl of limbs and roots, and watch helplessly as the three sisters disappeared into the oaks. In the great hall within Vitu Ghazi, the high priests and dignitaries of Selesnia were finally gathered. There, grown from the living wood of the world tree, were the three dryads. Earlier that day, they had magically materialized before a stunned crowd, sending a pulse throughout the world soul to gather. No one in the guild had felt such a surge for a long time, and hurried to the conclave in great hope. Little did they know that they would gaze upon their new guildmaster for the first time. When Suniel arrived, he recognized Sim, the central figure of the three, but as soon as she spoke, he realized the Sim he knew was no more. I am Trastani. As a demonstration of the founding principle and power of our guild, we have gone beyond ourselves and have become one being. We are the great concourse between Matsalesnia and all who follow her will. We have come from the heart of the Lattice to alter the course of Selesnia forever. A new age of glorious growth awaits our guild. Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play, or just plain sharing with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. The Great Concourse was written by Adam Lee. The podcast was produced and edited by Gin Keshi, with sound editing by Christina Edelman. This week's story featured the voice talents of Rebecca Durst, Purple Rogue, Beetle Bottle, Corbin Condon, J.W. Forsyth, Joe Loaf, Grace Noir, Liam Wilson, and Mel Teach. Voice of All is unofficial fan content, permitted under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. 
Magic the Gathering is copyright, Wizards of the Coast. Thanks so much for listening. And y'all have a great day. Or don't, you know, I don't. It's up to you, man. <laughs>